This tweet uh, has been getting me into some trouble. Apparently, they're trying to ratio me a little bit. And I've been getting a lot of quote tweets for this one. It's super controversial. And I don't know why, because it's like, it literally says, I wonder if you guys are ready to know. And it, okay, you're not ready to know, whatever then. You know? <laughs> I said, I wonder if you're ready to know. I didn't try to convince you. I said, I wonder if you're ready to know. I don't think you are, though. You know? Even you, my chat, I don't think you're ready to know, right? But I said, you know, I wonder if you guys are ready to know that we've already been living in socialism for a long time now and that you only think otherwise because of a new left gnostic heresy that personalized capitalism as a psychopathological vice instead of a mode of production. Now, Haas, what do you mean by that, Haas? What do you mean by that, Haas? What I mean is that there's literally a billion ways you can fucking look at it, but the socialist mode of production has more or less already prevailed over the capitalist one worldwide. Now, what do you mean, Hans? What do you mean by that? What do I mean? Okay. I'll explain it. I know it's gonna, it's gonna be a, 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 I mean, it's like, I don't, how do I do this for people who just haven't read Marx and Engels, right? I just have to, like, know where to start. Okay, so... Marx and Engels were talking about this thing called socialism, right? And, and, and communism. And for them, the capitalist mode of production was transitioning into communism or socialism, right? To socialism, to a different mode of production. And for them, the class struggle was being waged as the manifestation of this transition. So there was a transformation going on in the forces of production, and the class struggle was how this transformation was working at their level of the relations of production. There's the, there was no voluntary struggle for socialism where, like, the workers rose up together and like, guys, let's make a new system. No, there, the new system was already being born out of the old one. And... The manifestation of that fact at the political and social and discursive level was the proletarian class struggle. So there was no struggle to create socialism. There was no struggle to make a new system. There was no struggle to impose a new society. That was already happening. And Marx and Engels actually talked about it, specifically in the form of the joint stock market and a bunch of other shit. Specifically, you read Capital Volume 3, you'll understand this, right? So that was in the 19th century. Finally, by the 1890s, Engels would say something like, Look, now shit's about to get real. We're anticipating a big war is going to come. And... This war is going to make the proletariat victorious. It's going to be the death knell of capitalism. Capitalism is going to finally be done. Right? Okay. World War I happens. And the October Revolution also happens. And what do you know? Europe is fundamentally transformed. The mass conscription of World War I led to his unprecedented level of socialization of the forces of production. Lenin remarked upon this process in his book. I know you guys might be familiar with it. Are you guys familiar with Lenin's book? Imperialism, the highest stage, the one you're always seeing on Twitter. Because you think Lenin's book is some kind of like moral condemnation of imperialism. Well, maybe some of that is there. But in the main, it wasn't that. In the main, it was, an it was an analysis of what Lenin deemed to be a qualitatively new stage of capitalism, which he thought was going to be the last stage of capitalism, right? 
Lenin believed that imperialism was closer to socialism than the normal capitalism. For Lenin, imperialism corresponded to large-scale socialization, um, large-scale planning and all this kind of shit, right? And he directly talked about it. He directly talked about it, okay? Lenin dies in the mid-1920s. And 1929, the stock market and the global, or I should say world economy, the world capitalist economy, collapsed. There you go. The Great Depression literally destroyed capitalism. As Marx and Engels anticipated. They said it was coming, it came. 1929 was the year. So what happened after 1929? How, how did the economy recover? Well, the economy recovered, Haas. The economy recovered after 1929. What are you talking about? Uh-oh. What do you mean, the economy? You mean, you mean, you mean the vested political interest to ensure the production and distribution of goods can still can still operate smoothly. The very category of the economy is a political cat cat category. The economy recovered, yes, <laughs> because it became the vested political interest of the ruling class through the mechanism of the state to ensure the normal production and distribution of goods can continue. So the ruling class was scared shitless. They're the lifeblood of what got them into power completely collapsed. So they used the state for political purposes in order so that there won't be a revolution that's going to come or there won't be some kind of fucking, you know, communist change, right? in order to plan the start planning the economy and intervening in the economy in such a way so as to establish a social form of production you think after 1929 that was just capitalism you think that was just capitalism? Capitalism died, dude. The shit that came after that was political. That was political. It wasn't just like, you know, capitalism is something called the anarchy of production. It's literally the. It's capitalism is when you have this anarchy of production of. This aggregation of competing enterprises and competing uh, businesses and capitalists and this coalesces and aggregates into some kind of like market of some kind right that's capitalism that collapsed in 1929 so after 1929 the economy's livelihood became a political concern of the state So what is the socialist mode of production? 
What does it mean for there to be a socialist mode of production? Well, let me put it this way, right? You have to understand that within capitalism or modern capitalism, you're dealing with this hidden symbolic economy of titles, of property ownership, of money itself, which is a form of signification. It's a, it's a symbol, right? These suddenly take a social form in socialism. These signals that change the economy and signal produce the necessary signals or inputs into the process of production and distribution. When Austrians and neoclassical ec economists talk about the market as producing price signals, that is a category of central planning. Information is a question of central planning. It's not a question of a spontaneous market working itself out. It's a matter of something that's for economic planning. When's the next showdown? Z somewhere. Can you shut your stupid fucking mouth? You fucking idiot. Interrupting me with your stupid fucking question pinging me when you know the fucking showdowns have consistently been every fucking Friday at 7 p.m. EST. Shut the fuck up and stop asking me when's the next fucking showdown, you fucking idiot. Money went from being a signifier wealth to being... An... No. Okay, no. You guys have to bear with me here, right? I'm trying to tell you a story. And it's too, it's too hard to explain this whole fucking story to you. I can't give you a history lesson, you know, on the origins of the crash of 29. And then the Bretton Woods system after World War II. And then the causes and reasons for World War II in the first place. Then the Bretton Woods system. And then all of the shit that happened. But more or less, I want to explain it to you this way. I want to explain it to you this way, right? Let me, let me explain it to you this way. Let me go ahead and explain it to you this way. We're going to do some paint. We're going to do some Microsoft paint. Paint, okay? I'm going to explain it to you very simply. It's so simple, right? Before capitalism. Okay? It's like this, right? M, C, M, C. Money, is you start with a commodity, you gain money to get other, to get more commodities, right? It's all about, it ends with some kind of commodity, right? Supposedly, this is what Marx. This is not really true, but it's a simplification, right? Capitalism. Fuck. Capitalism. The fuck happened? Before capitalism, supposedly according to Marx, Engels. C M C. Capitalism. Money, commodity, money. More money, right? Socialism. Okay, I'm going to explain these. So before capitalism, you had. You start with the commodity, you put it into, you sell it for some money, right? And then you use that money to purchase more commodities and you just have more shit and more wealth. Like that's, I think that's what Marx and Engels were thinking, right? It's just the accumulation of things. It's the accumulation of things that is the source of power in the pre-capitalist economy, right? Now with capitalism, you have money use the money to purchase, invest into commodities, and it's money prime. You get more fucking money, right? So what is socialism? How, do, how does this 
become sublated in socialism. Socialism does not put an end to MCM crime. MCM is not abolished, but sublated into a and de-essentialized. Sublated and de-essentialized. What does that mean? MCM does not become the ends of production. MCM does not become the ends of production. Become the ends, but the moment of production. Does this make sense to you? So MCM, the pursuit of money for money's sake, right, doesn't become the ends of production, but a moment of production. MCM becomes an indication if you are being profitable and therefore if your enterprise is efficient or if your enterprise is ultimately sustainable, right? But it becomes a category of planning because your enterprise no longer exists for MCM. If MCM alone is what defined the longevity or the purpose of enterprises, why is it then when these fucking companies go bankrupt and they fuck this up, MCM, they're not able to be profitable, they're still able to be propped up by banks or by loans or by some kind of uh, print, uh, some kind of uh, printing of government uh, credit, right? Government money to be distributed into the economy. Because the purpose of production, the ultimate purpose of production, the ultimate purpose of production is political, is political and social. I should say social first and then political. Social and political. It's about the purpose of production. Not See, there's a really big Western bias where Westerners care a lot about procedure, right? So they want to say if the procedure is not socialist, it's not socialist, right? That's why they say China isn't socialist because the procedure is the private market economy, right? But the outcome is social, right? But they don't care about the outcome, they care about the procedure. It's the same politically. Now, with China, the procedure for how the decisions um, are made is not really democratic. But the outcome is democratic. Right? It's the same fucking pathology. So, how, how does MCM work? Um, abstract forms, there is no socialist equivalent to MCM because the object of social production is not, uh, cannot be formalized as a variable. or DMC this object is rather this is gonna not make any fucking sense to you guys aesthetical Aesthetical, um, ideological, perhaps. Aesthetical, ideological, and then what else? Yeah, those both work. Aesthetical and ideological. Uh, ideological, and I don't I feel like it's not enough. Aesthetical. 
ideological and what's the word I'm fucking looking for? No, transcendental. Transcendental is what I was looking for. You want me to give you an example of this? The Marvel Cinematic Universe, or Disney. What's the reason for the Marvel Cinematic Universe? Is it just to generate profits? Does it exist to generate profits? Don't underestimate it. The Marvel Cinematic Universe, there's so much fucking merchandise. There's so much fucking commodities, right? So many chains of production and supply chains are being cohered around the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Or think about the fucking iPhone. Let's say this was an iPhone. This is an iPhone. It needs this, this, this amount of resources. And this, this, this is what goes into it. How many fucking supply chains and chains of production are organized around the desire for the iPhone? What comes first, the chicken or the egg? Is it because of this intangible, aesthetical desire for the iphone and by aesthetical i mean for whatever cultural or unconscious or ideological whatever reason people want iphones they want them is it that people want iphones because material reality um positions it in such a way that it aesthetically uh it makes it aesthetically desirable or does the aesthetic desire for the iphone make material reality itself which one comes first does that make sense guys think about the iphone what comes first do people want iphones because of material reality or does the want of the iphone itself change the material reality after all think about all of the supply chains that are organized around the production of the iphone the want changed material reality? No, the opposite can be said to be true as well. The opposite can also be said to be true. The want is also produced by material reality. The want itself is material. There's something material about the want itself. Well, this is where you can't fall into the trap of one-sidedness. Both are in a sense true. Both are in a sense true. It's both. It's actually both at the same time. That is what material reality's relationship to desire is. But if we're materialists, we know that the material reality is primary. Which means uh, the want of the iPhone does not produce the want of the iPhone, more or less, right? So that's just one example, the iPhone. Now, think about how... Now, I just used an example of one... one I, don't, I don't even like... Is the iPhone a commodity in Marx's sense of the word? Do you really think the iPhone is just a commodity in Marx's sense of the word? No, it's fucking not. It's a symbol. It's a brand. It's a fucking... It's a sublime object of ideology. It's not some kind of fucking... It's not just a commodity, right? Like a fucking sack of potatoes. It's qualitatively different than that, right? Now, zoom out from the fucking iPhone and think about this at... at the level of... Um, the culture industry. How much do things like, not just, but things like the Marvel cin Cinematic Universe, beyond determining our um, purchase of goods, like merchandise and stuff, how much does that shape, like, 
how much does that play a role in defining the types of goods we buy on a day-to-day basis and how we actually make sense of our world and how we position ourselves within this world? Well, let me put it this way. Why don't you just go to the example of communism? Isn't the motivation, the ideological promise of the, the, the shining radiant communist future a pretty important factor in um, determining people's motivations and habits and behavior and so on in the ex-communist states? Under communism, isn't what's kind of driving people along the promise of this radiant communist future? So this kind of has a material effect at the level of the forces of production, doesn't it? This has a material effect at the level of the forces of production. The same is true. I'm speaking generally in terms of ideology, right? The same is true for Marvel, right? In our society, or if not Marvel, then it can be something else. Some kind of dream-like vision. You know, in China... Xi Jinping has initiated the era of the Chinese dream because our mode of production has become very dreamlike. We need these dreams uh, to continue the process of production along. Who's Elon Musk? Who is this guy? What's Tesla? What's SpaceX? What's all this shit? Elon Musk is not a marginal force. Billions and billions and maybe even trillions, I don't know, of probably not trillions, just billions, right, of dollars are being moved. Livelihoods are being defined, right, taken away or, or brought up solely on the basis of what this fucking guy tweets. Elon Musk is promising the dream of going to Mars. Isn't he? He's a dream seller. Exactly. Precisely, he's a dream seller. Isn't that what Disney is? Isn't that what Apple is? They're all dream sellers. Every fucking major company you know of is a dream seller. They are promising you a big, big, bold future through them. No company simply confines itself anymore to just being, hey, you know, we just make toilets. That's all. I mean, some do. But they're being swallowed up by Amazon. Now, Amazon's making the toilets, right? Or at least, Am yeah, Amazon's making those fucking toilets now, right? So, every single company is promising you the dream of communism now, right? This ultimate dream that's fucking cohering all the chains of production and the supply chains of production. McDonald's is the fucking holy savior of your life now mcdonald's is your lifesaver mcdonald's is your lord and savior it's not just about fucking selling hamburgers anymore it's about selling you a dream for ultimately and radically changing the future black lives matter right social change Trans lives matter. Social change. Now the thing is, I'm speaking about these companies, McDonald's, all of them in isolation. But they're all acting in cohort. They're all acting in tandem. All of the corporations are acting in tandem, more or less. That's how it works in China too, by the way. Every single corporation in china every single company the communist party has a seat at that company so every single company is towing the party line and the party line gets executed through these companies right the same thing is happening in america and every other fucking country in the world except we don't have communist parties that are accountable to the people we have deep states and oligarchies that we don't even know about I'm not saying markets have disappeared. I'm not saying profit has disappeared. I'm just saying those have become epicycles of a much bigger 
mode of production. The mode of production is no longer based on those things. They've become subsumed. Yes, they've become subsumed. I want to teach you about Plato. Can I teach you guys about Plato? Let me teach you about Plato. I think you need to learn about Plato. Let me teach you a little bit about Plato. Let me teach you a little about Plato. Or nothing intimidating, don't worry. For Plato, he, he resolves to answer the question of forms. The question of forms. Both M, C, M, a variable is a form, okay? Uh, how, how do I explain it, this? The question of forms, okay? Money. Before we... No, no, I'm going to do before we begin before this, okay? Right here. Before we begin... And I'm going to get rid of this. Before we begin... Let's think about the variables in MCM and CMC, right? Money and commodity. What are these? Money. The total alienated human ability. Marx. Money. Money. Um... Isn't it? Human labor. Money is the total alienated, alienated human ability in general. Money is access to all the products of human labor and ability. What is money itself? Can you guys think about this? A store of value. What a dipshit. What a dipshit. A store of value. What's value? What is fucking value? It's a store of value. What's value? Before we get to value, does money come first or does value come first? Do you have some value lying around that you got to store in some money? No. By the time you have value, you have money. So let's ask the question, what is money? A value utility. What a cuck answer. The value is value utility. Oh, it's value utility. Sorry. No, it's not. It's not fucking utility. It's not utility, right? It's not utility. Utility for what? To do what? To do what specifically? Okay. Money is alienated human ability in general. Money is the access to all the products, human labor, and ability. But what is money itself? But what is money itself? What possibly gives rise to the separation between money on the one hand 
and the sum total of labor products of labor etc on the other and th on the other has anyone ever thought about this by the way Everyone in this chat is a cuck. You are all cucks. It's a tool. It's a tool. Everything's a tool. Because you're such a wise and smart guy. Everything's a tool, right? Everything is a tool. I'm just using it as a tool to play video games. It's all a tool to play Minecraft. You don't even know what you want in this life. What gives rise to this distinction of money? Why must money be separate from everything else that money buys for? Money equals all the labor, goods, and services of a society right money is what measures them why is money separate from all of those things is the question why is money itself separate from all of those things i've talked about this before on stream this exact thing For example, let's say you have two tribes, right? Let's say you have two tribes. And these two tribes, one of them produces, um, one of them produces, fuck, I don't know, beads, right? Beaded necklaces or some shit. And the under, other one produces, uh, Pelts. So one produces pelts, one produces beaded necklaces. I don't know, this is a stupid example, right? All, uh, so the things that e people in this tribe need, right? Are finite. Whatever we need, we get as a tribe, and we can exchange it with another tribe if they produce something we don't have. And we have to exchange it because we can't just take it from them or we can just take it from them, in which case we're just going to go enslave them. But insofar as we're not going to have slavery, in order for us to deal with another tribe, we're going to exchange with each other, right? Right? Does that make sense? Can you guys stop getting ahead of yourself and just rein it back and just fucking simplify it for a second? Okay, so that's bartering. You guys ever heard of bartering? One good for another good. That's bartering. You're bartering. I did. It's a tool. You are literally a stupid fuck. When your mom told you, you were she, that you were smart, she was doing you a disservice. Okay. So bartering, that's fine. But at what point do you have the abstraction of something called money? What's fucking money? At what point can this bartering give rise to one commodity 
whose sole value, so to speak, is to exchange for other commodities. It itself is not a commodity that's useful in any kind of fucking way. Money is not useful. It's not useful. It has no fucking use beyond exchanging for other commodities. So at what point can, do, do you arrive at that abstraction is the question you have to fucking ask of money. But if you need to quantify the value of the barter, no, it's not. So many fish equals so many pelts. You don't need money to quantify that. FWP just said something really smart for the first time in this dumbass chat. Yes. Debt. Yes. Debt. Now you're getting somewhere interesting. If you're indebted in some kind of way, you owe others something. You have some kind of obligation to them, and you owe them. You have a debt to them. Let's say, for example, someone gives you uh, some sheep, right? You owe them a debt. But for what? What do you owe them? Do you owe them sheep? Well, there's a debt in general. You owe me so-and-so sheep. I don't have sheep. Okay, so what can be the equivalent of those sheep you just gifted me? Literally everything. Suddenly, everything in general and in the abstract must be um, subjected to a common standard. Five sheep equals what? Five fish and two pelts and, you know, whatever. Right? Something to keep in mind. We're trying to get close to the question of what money is, right? What money itself is. I'm not saying money is debt. I'm saying, how can we think about in this hypothetical abstraction, how you can arrive at the abstraction of money? And debt is an intelligent way of trying to arrive at it. But I don't know if that's necessarily correct. We're all we're dealing with chicken and egg fucking hypotheticals. Historically speaking, it's much more complicated, right? Everything is always already there historically, right? This by the way, this idea of evolutionism is the completely biggest bullshit discredited piece of shit, stupid thing that's ever been uh associated with Marxism because we know it's not fucking true. Every single idea of evolutionism of uh, a human society is completely wrong. Of stages, different stages. It's completely wrong. But anyway, you, you guys are children, and, and I'm sorry, but you're just stupid people. Money is something to pay back. The horse does this. The donkey does this. The lion does this. This is why the grass is green and the sky is... You're a fucking idiot. All right? Before you ask the question of why something exists or what it serves or what it is for, ask what it is. Anyway,
Didn't I tell you we're going to talk about Plato? So bear with me. The essence of labor abstracted. What's labor? I'll tell you why, more or less. I will tell you why. Because in every human society in the history of mankind, there was one object of worship, veneration, whatever, that was not only the particular like deity of each and every society and tribe, but was literally the way in which they were interfacing with the whole of being. The whole universe, the whole cosmos, everything. All being. The whole of being is one and the same as the common object of all human society. And this itself is given expression ritualistically, symbolically, and so on and so on. In some kind of way. All society is organized around it. You understand? The total human ability and labor of a given society is an expression of mankind's relationship to it, to this common social object. It's, you're going slow. It sounds like we replaced one abstraction with another. Should I just ban your dumb fuck from my fucking chat? You stupid fuck.
I don't have time for dumb fucking children who can't think patiently. And need to arrive at a conclusion immediately without thinking. No one has a fucking gun to your head, bitch. You can think about this. You understand? You don't have to arrive at a conclusion yet. You're not forced to. No one's fucking life depends on it right now. No one has a gun to your fucking head and is forcing you to spit out a conclusion. You can actually just shut your stupid fuck mouth and think for a second. The question is, can this common object of society, right? Let's assume society is communist for a moment. It has one common object. Let's just begin with that abstraction. The question is, what does it mean for such a society to have an economy? An economy, right? Let's do some Heideggerian bullshit where we look up the etymology of a word and develop and explore the meaning of that word from that, right? So let's just do that for a second. Let's just do that. Okay. I want to just give you guys an idea of, <laughs> of how you do this. So here's the etymology from Google of economy. It comes from the root word of oikos, which means not house, by the way. I will explain the, the, the meaning of the word uh, oikos in Greek. It doesn't just mean house, by the way. And nemein, which means marriage. Okay? So this is oikonomia, household management. Oikonomia is the word it comes from. There you go. That's the source of economy. Oikos, however, does not just mean house. So this is a, a misleading simplification. Interestingly, an oikos is a form of living being. This is the oikos from Wikipedia, right? Which says, it refers to three distinct concepts. The family, the family's property, and the house. The oikos is the basic unit of society in most Greek city-states. So, here's what's going on. With the oikos, right? The oikos. You are dealing with the way in which, let's say, a given unit of a society, this one communist society, let's, hypothetically, it's a communist society, right? In our head. This unit of this uh, communist society, how does it reproduce itself? How does it attend to its living being? How does it feed itself, clothe itself, shelter itself? How does it manage its family, its, its, its way of living, its way of life, right? This is oikos. But then you have the question of the oikos, for example, when given ideal representation, enters into contradiction with the means of its uh, reproduction. So, for example... Let's say, for instance, you are a communist household. I, I don't fucking know, right? You're just a household in a communist society, an oikos, so some, some family unit or something, right? And you have to reproduce your existence. You may have the ideal, for example, in the reproduction of your existence. Um, the aim and end of your life is what? Well... The aim and end of your life, if you're living in some kind of social uh, society, is going to be beyond yourself. It's going to be, for example, for your family. For your family. And then beyond your family, for your tribe. 
and beyond your tribe for your uh what is it gens how do they call it for your gens then beyond gens for your uh, state right for your state But this is not one and the same with the means by which you do this. There's a contradiction. Any idealization, for example, of the ultimate ends and aims of your oikos, your living being, of what your living being is, is different from the material prerequisites to reproducing it. So materially speaking, for example, you're going to have to um, get into the dirt of material material reality com that is completely, um, let's say, indifferent to this ideal um, idealization. And you have to obey it as something that needs to be attended to on its own terms. So I'm going to repeat the question. Let's say we have a society with a completely common object. Completely common object. It's a communist kind of society, right? Hypothetically. Or maybe it's like Plato's Republic, if that, if that helps. You necessarily have a form of living being corresponding to this relation to the common object an oikos right an oikos And in the process of this living being, through this oikos, you have uh, you have uh, the basic requirement to attend to the material prerequisites to its reproduction. So an economy, an economy is opposed to the state in a simple way, right? This communist state, let's say. This communist society. Lol, you said communist state. Yes, I fucking did, bitch. Suck my cock. Communism is stateless, though. Shut the fuck up, you dumb bitch. You don't know the first fucking thing about communism. The living being. So what is living being, first of all? What is oikos in relation to the ultimate ends and aims of the platonic ideal state, the republic? Oikos basically means that insofar as I have as my ideal aim and ends the Republic, um, I necessarily must still attend not only to my needs as a human being to reproduce myself, but to my relationship with my forebears, with nature, with my progeny. This is living being. Living being is the manner by which one reproduces this cycle. After entering into, in, into some form of intercourse with the ideal's opposite, which is nature or material reality, and reproducing oneself, right? 
reproducing one's family, reproducing one's household, and so on and so on. That's the oikos. The oikos is the living being. But how that occurs isn't going to be uh, determined by the ideal of the state. Because you can't know. You understand? Insofar as we... Uh, are attending to our material premises, feeding, clothing ourselves, and doing all this kind of stuff, dealing with this otherness of nature, material reality, this otherness of our own premises, of even, for example, attending to the needs of our body as human beings, right? Uh, like feeding ourselves and shit, right? This cannot be known preemptively by the ideal form of the state or the common community. Which means <clears throat> that is why at the point in which the economy must be treated as a sphere separate from the state. The state is not one and the same with the economy because the economy deals with the material premises of the state and the individuals that form the state, that comprise the state. That's why you have that basic distinction. That's why you have that basic distinction in the first place. But here's the thing. The relationship between the state as a common universality of a given society. And by universality, don't be intimidated by this word. Let's say we all live on a fucking island somewhere, for example. And we have a platonic republic. The ideal republic on a fucking island. The universality of the state will extend no farther than the material reality of its constituents. No? No? So insofar as we are part of this island, the state is universal. So don't get too fucking caught up on this. Where money enters into the picture is curiously. The otherness of the state. The ideal republic, let's say, of Plato. I am not, by the way, describing the genesis or origin of money historically. I'm trying to allow you to think in, a, in this abstraction so you can understand what money is. You can understand what money is in the first place. Okay? Please keep that in mind. I'm not describing a causal relationship of the chicken and the egg and so on and so on. I'm describing this so we can arrive at a better concept of what money is or a better understanding of what money is. So, with regard to the universality of the state on the one hand, and on the other hand, the otherness of nature, the otherness of the material premises, that mankind must necessarily enter into some form of intercourse with in order to reproduce the ideal republic. You have, on the one hand, Plato's philosophical abstraction of the ideal uh, republic. But... This republic, for example, uh, the manner by which it is reproduced cannot be attended to ideally. Hence, the need to arrive at a fundamental distinction between statehood and economics. The way in which, in material reality, we reproduce this republic is a different business than how you do it ideally, right, in the sphere of politics. Uh, or in the sphere of, for example, the philosophy of politics. <clears throat> the 
Politics, maybe you say, Haas, why are you idealizing politics? What's this platonic idealism? Why not have a Hobbesian materialism of politics? After all, politics is founded on the ruthless... It, politics is a material thing. It's based on material power, ruthless bloodshed, and, and so on and so on. Because it's easier if we begin with the ideal republic. Because the material reality of politics of policies um, would be a would make me veer off into a, a different uh, con conversation right so let's just begin with the universal ideal state of plato plato um so we can arrive at the distinction of economy right now, let's, even in a Hobbesian jungle where everyone's, you know, it's battle royale and everyone's killing each other, last man, last man standing is the king uh, that everyone must obey or whatever, right? The Hobbesian idea. Even then, um, the question then stands is what is the expression of that sovereignty or sovereignty, right? However you say it, sovereignty. How, what is the expression of that sovereignty? in um in material reality in so far as how people reproduce this well that's not something the sovereign is capable of willing or determining so it's the same thing as the ideal republic it's the same contradiction uh, i mean that we're speaking of um and by the way the abstraction i'm giving you is actually backwards because from a materialist perspective, first you have living being, and then you have the I whatever this ideal republic or the state, right? But we're learning it backwards because it's it, we begin from this idealist prejudice. So we're working backwards. Uh, <clears throat> anyway. Um, with the economy, we are, of course, dealing with many different material things, right? Many different material things, different discrete things that are exchanged, that are bought, that are sold. We're not really dealing with a subsistence economy at this point. If we're dealing with an economy of pure subsistence, what need would there be, or what how could there be, rather, a common state in the first place? If everyone's just attending to their own subsistence, surely at the very least, there needs to be some kind of surplus to that subsistence that's used to reproduce this common social state. Or what, what else unites people's sociality, right? So clearly we're beyond the mere reality of subsistence for separate so households, right? Here's the thing, just in as much as we have the universalism of this ideal state or republic, there's also a dark universal, a kind of dark universal. What's this dark universalism? We have on the one hand the ideal state, the ideal state, no, the ideal state. On the other hand, you have what I describe as the material premises of that state in the form of the economy. But the economy is composed of various separate different things. How do you get to money? How do you get to money? An economy is a bunch of random shit. Horse shit and fish and fur and, uh, I don't know, 
you, you know what I mean? Like uh, a horse and sheep and cattle and grain and potatoes, whatever the fuck you want, right? Assorted shit. You have one universalism of the state and a bunch of shit, right? The shit being the manif some kind of uh, testament to the otherness of the state that the economy attends to. This otherness being nature, material premises, and more specifically, and more importantly, human labor. The otherness of human labor, the metabolism of human labor, the manner by which mankind enters into intercourse with nature. It's curious. I don't want to detract. It's curious. If you ever read Marx early, it's curious this passage in the seventh chapter of Capital. You think Marx is a materialist, right? So he places emphasis on material writing. Why does Marx say this? We presuppose labor in the form of stamps. It is a, exclusively human. A spider conducts operations that resemble those of a weaver, and a bee puts to shame many an architect in the construction of her cells. But what distinguishes the worst architect from the best of bees is this. That the architect raises his structure in imagination before he erects it in reality. Isn't that a little weird when you read that first? It was for me. May, like 10 years ago when I was in high school in freshman year. And I was trying to read Capital. I read this passage and it really weirded me out because I thought, wait, I thought Marx was a materialist. How can he define labor based on the fact that a, an architect first idealizes the object of his production and then works upon it. Shouldn't it be the opposite? It's a little strange. Isn't this a kind of idealist view? First you have the ideal and then you work toward it and that's how we define it. It confused me, right? But I understand it now because... It makes a lot of sense. What is human labor? One of the ways you can think about human labor, human labor, right, is the way in which I have an ideal ends of production. I just am using here the total universal platonic ideal republic as this ideal of labor. So it's a communist platonic society. Plato was obviously a communist, right? We all know that. I hope everyone here is smart enough to know that. But first you have this, and then the manner by which one reproduces this by entering into some kind of relationship with nature. That is labor. That is labor. That's labor. This transformative process where man changes his surroundings in conformity with some kind of ideal That is the power of labor for Marx. We have on the one hand the state, Plato's ideal republic, as the manifestation of the common ends of all life. The common ends of every constituent citizen and human being that's under its dominion. And on the other hand, you have the state's economy, 
which represents its otherness. Labor being the mediating factor between the two. This otherness, as it happens, possesses form. It's not just that the universal immediacy of the state possesses form and unity. The otherness also possesses form and unity. The economy is not just some collection of shit. As I said. Because the economy in the first place is based on reproducing the ideal republic. So how can it just be a collection of shit? What about... And here's the question. What does the ideal republic itself trade for? Sheep trade for this. The dog shit trades for this. Fish trade for that. Bear pelt tra trades for that. What does the ideal republic itself trade for? What is its economic... Uh, how can you turn the state itself into a commodity? How do you turn the state itself into a commodity? Commoditize the state itself. The universalism of the state to become an, a commodity. Or at least to become an object of economic exchange. That, my friends, that, my friends, is exactly. What a little coin does. A little coin that has an inscription, has the head of a uh, state on it, the emperor. That's what it does. That's what that little coin means. To tell you the truth, the state, every state, is a whore. The state is a whore. That's the truth. It pretends to be a sovereign authority, a sublime uh, a sublime uh, a sublime and common unity of the people, right? It is raised above the whole of society and the world. But the state must be involved in the business of its own economy. Because the economy is nothing other than the economy of the state itself. Every single form of currency in history was political. One of the primary and even exclusive sometimes functions of the state in history was the monopoly on coinage. Even when gold was the universal form of currency, the state still has a monopoly on the coinage of coins.
I'll tell you the truth. I said the state is a whore, but it's more like a kind of walk of shame. It's a gold coin, a solar, right? And um, kind of, what's the word? A glorious solar, right? It's a piece of the sun, a piece of gold, right? I'm kind of describing it in a, a vulgar way, honestly. I'm kind of being like a little critical and snarky and shit. Because there's a beauty of money too. It's not just a prostitute. And then it has inscriptions of God, religion, or the, the emperor, or the whatever, right? And this is the dignity of the state. The state says, in confronting the universality of its own material otherness, the coin is the response to that. Remember, the word dialectic comes from dialogue. Like dialogue, right? So you have the ideal republic, and then you have this otherness the republic itself cannot account for on its own terms. This otherness of economy and human labor, right? So the state, so this is the state, here's nature. The state responds with a coin. You see? The coin is its response, its shield, its shield. The thing is, the state had already gotten fucked. It already got fucked. This was its response to getting fucked. First, you had the state. Then you had the otherness of economy, for example, labor. By this time, this has opened its mouth. The state had gotten fucked. And this is its response, the coin, currency, money. Money arises because the state or the ideal republic plato's ideal communist republic confronts its own material otherness and it gives form to this otherness it responds to this otherness in the form of money now how does it confront this material otherness let's just say where this is a hypothetical scenario and it's on an island Right to be the ideal state, for example, um, wants to exist in a certain way, but the material necessities of life demand it exists in another way. This humiliation necessitates the recognition of some kind of some kind of disunity, some kind of otherness of material premises versus the ideal. Right. And it gives expression to this otherness in the form of money to maintain itself. Money is the state. It is the state. That's what money is. Money is the state in the economy. What is the state itself worth in the economy? Remember I told you, what is the state purchase for? What is the state worth? What does that purchase for? That's what money is. We didn't even talk about Plato yet. So let's answer our question. Answer.
answer money is the state in the economy I talked to you before about the distinction between the, the different things and what unites them. First, I want to make a connection that Lacan did in his seminar, The Ethics of Psychoanalysis already, which is between Plato's good and commodity goods. Lacan actually uh, says these are related. It's not, for, it's not for nothing they're related, by the way. I don't even know the etymology of commodity goods, but it's not for nothing that they're, this, they're written the same way. What is the good? What is the good? Plato's good. The good is the form of forms. Plato resolves to answer. Plato resolves to answer the question of forms. In the discontinuity, there are discontinuities in space and time. There are different things. They have form. They have, they have, they have the consistency of form. They are coherent, intelligible, different objects, right? Different forms. Plato, des Plato describes as the good the form of form itself, itself. The form of all forms, the form of all the forms of forms of reality. Plato used the example of the sun as the good because on the one hand, without the sun, we would not be able to perceive reality. But on the other hand, you cannot look at the sun. For Plato, the form of forms is not 
itself a form. The good, which is beyond beauty, justice, and truth, say it's higher than these things, better way of putting it. Which is beyond beauty, justice, and truth. Is pure form in general, or oh, sorry, is form in general, the abstraction of form in general. The ultimate object and final object of thought. Sure, God, why not? Why not? The good is the monad. <sighs> it's not itself, let's say, a worldly form. Phenomenal. Let's just say phenomenal form, because this is ambiguous. Hold on. Give me a sec.
Yo, critically thinking veteran. Thank you so much, man. How you doing, man? Thanks so much, bro. Appreciate you. Appreciate you a lot, man. You gonna be there? All right, guys. Awesome. I'm so excited, actually. It's gonna be sick. I don't know how the competition's really gonna stand a chance, dude. You, you just go in and you massacre. You know what I mean? You're like uh, a prized gladiator. You know. <laughs> oh yeah, Pesto's gonna be there too. Yeah. It'll be interesting. It's actually going to be interesting. You want to know what I love about uh, this one, too, is that we're actually going to have a lot of interesting topics and, and stuff to talk about. It's not just going to be like, you know. I want to promote more diversity of anti-establishment views so we can talk about interesting things, you know. But yeah, as I was saying. Um... Yeah. But anyway, as I was saying, um uh, So, Plato first, what are the topics? Uh either tonight or tomorrow earlier. I'll uh, I'll 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 announce all the topics in the Discord. But, um, yeah. So, Plato first writes about this in the book, The Republic. The Republic. Which is a book about philosophy, not experimentation. But what the good is supposed to make you appreciate or recognize is that it's almost kind of similar to Heidegger. Right? Heidegger, if you're familiar with him, talks about being and then being in general. For Plato, it's the same as far as the question of form and then the form in general, right? For different forms and then form as such, the good. Plato identifies this as the good. So for Plato, the good, even in an ethical and moral sense of the word, it's the good in every meaningful sense of the word, you can, you can put it, right? Uh, it has all of the connotations and associations. It's not just one specific philosophical meaning. It has all of those ethical whatever implications you need. The good shows us that the thing, there is one thing, there is one good that makes coherent the whole of our reality. In a way, Plato's main contribution to the history of human thought, as far as I can see, is that Plato reveals that um, what makes our reality consistent and coherent, what allows us to have different forms, to, to perceive and uh, make intelligible, as I should say, make intelligible different forms is the fact that there is a form first form of forms itself there is a form of forms itself all the intelligibility of reality has all things that are intelligible within reality so far as they are intelligible to us this intelligibility has one common object Just one common object. <clears throat> Plato's Republic envisions a universal and ideal republic that subsumes all of the um, human society 
as serving one common aim, one common ends, and one common object. Because for him, the republic is the form of the good, political form of the good. The republic is the highest ends of the society. It's the highest ends and aims of the whole of the human society. It's what people live, breathe, die, whatever for, for Plato. It is the ultimate ethical unity, right? It is the common object of all uh, activity, the Republic. Keep in mind what I said before here, because we want to keep our eye on, on the ball, which is what Plato can teach us about MCM. And the corresponding implications for the question of how we no longer live in capitalism, for example. Thank you, one final gameplay. Appreciate you. So I just want you to be familiar with that platonic terminology, right? For now. So as it happens, it turns out, turns out, the good, the good, the good has determinate form. That is in the form of the state. The state I just described to you that has a monopoly, for example, on the minting of currency. Thank you, Gizmo Fisherman. Um, the core subject is, I wanted to talk about Plato and the relationship to MCM and CMC for Marxist capital. Because I was trying to tell a bunch of Twitter lefties that we no longer live in capitalism. Form of the state. The main point for Plato is that form is not given. Forms exist. There are different forms because of one single form, which is the form of those forms themselves.
No, we didn't enter into Platonic Republic, Morlock. We, we transition out of a Platonic Republic, actually, right? Because gold money is Platonic money. It's good money. By the way, guys, this is why we're never having a lecture stream again. And I told you we're never doing them again. Right? Because people don't want to fucking hear this shit. Every time I do it, nobody fucking wants to hear it. This isn't what gets views. It's the source. For Plato, we first have this one form as our object. And then reality is made intelligible. Then, consequentially... as a consequence made intelligible and divided into different things. Isn't the ends and aim of our life singular? We have a bunch of shit in our lives. Things. Things in our lives, right? Different things. And they somehow have the consistency of form. Let's say a tree outside. You have the idea of a tree. The form of a tree. And its consistency in reality. Okay? But why? Don't you realize that insofar as the tree enters your vision, your sight, or your noumenal sight, let's say, as something intelligible, as a form, this is only an insofar as you are already given and delivered, in a sense, to a more fundamental object. Things that enter your phenomenal vision in life are not simply just there. You go outside and you see shit. They're not simply just there. To what extent, for example... Is the idea of those things what determines them? That's why Plato's known for his thing about the shadow, the cave, Plato's cave with the shadows on the wall, right? And the idea that there's a fire and that there's a bunch of shadows and that you don't actually see real things in reality. When you go outside and you look at different things, you're not seeing those real things. You're seeing shadows on the wall, right? That's what he's known for, Plato's cave.
So what makes your reality coherent and holds it together is one thing. The form of the commodity. I'm just gonna fucking wrap this up and then and then go offline because you know 350 viewers, nobody wants to see this shit. So I'm gonna wrap it up really quick and then head out. Right. The form of the commodity. Or Marx's commodity form, right? What really is a form? What is a form, right? In the sense, what is a pure form? The form of what something is. Insofar as something has a form, it is, it's, it is uh, the way of something for you. It is the way something is for you, right? The way something is. But the way things are have an ultimate singular. The way things are are because of one way. This is Plato's monotheism. The way things are is because the whole of being is a way, right? All things are part of one reality. Trees, shit, uh, fuck, grass, mountains, whatever. All of these things are the way they are because of the way reality is. In general. Okay? A commodity is a thing, right? It's a thing. It's a thing that is exchanged. So the form of the thing for use for exchange in the economy, the form of a thing in the economy is a commodity. Commodities, commodities are the forms of, a commodity is the form of a thing in the economy. In the sphere of economic change. And so far as it concerns economic exchange.
Why are they called goods? Commodities also called goods. Because, because they are instances of the good and of form. The form, form of forms. Here, the ideal republic. Here, the ideal republic, or, or its currency. I'm not writing a fucking substack right now, you dumb fuck. Should I say money is the form of forms? I'm really just not content saying that, or maybe I'm just fucking confusing myself. Because it's not. It's not that the state is the commodity and the money. It's that the abstractionism of the state in relation to people or its universalism leads to a relationship to human labor in general that is correspondingly abstract and correspondingly universal in the form of money and that things become measured in this form which is money that's the point Is money the form of the state in the economy like a commodity is the form of a thing in the economy? Yes. Yes, it is. Yes. Yes.
a lot of people don't get Plato, right? Because you tell them about the good and the form of forms, and they say, what is that? How could I look at that? How could I interact with that? What, how could I see that? And Plato is trying to tell you, he writes about this, right? That this is a kind of infantile, childish, misguided uh, insistence. The whole point is, what is the thing, right? What is, uh, you're taking for granted the different things that are already within your reality, the different forms. Plato says the good is the form of form as such. It's outside of space and time. It is perfection. It is eternity. It is changeless. The form of form itself. Ain't that math? Yes, actually, it literally is. <clears throat> literally is the object of mathematics. I'm not even kidding about that, by the way. It's like the whole reason this shit is happening. The whole fucking reason this sh philosophy shit is happening after Socrates is because of mathematics. It's all a response to mathematics. All Greek philosophy is a response to mathematics, actually. Yes. The emergence of mathematics as a discipline. Money, the form of the economic, economic good. To not be confusing. The economic good. The point is... The point is... Is the state conceived as collectively or self-interested? What? The state is the common unity of the people. It is what the people literally are. It's the form of what they are. Their being. Right? Money, the economic good. The commodity is in the economy. What is the state in? The state is the state. It is like the state of the people. Like, think of the word state itself. 
like the state of things. That's what the state is. So what is it in? It's Yeah, like a state of being. Yeah, that's a good way of thinking about it. It's a very good way of thinking about it. Oh, God. The state is the form of the people. Does that make money the form of the people as they currently are in the economy? Thank you for the five, Orla. I appreciate you. No, it does not. Because the state is the form of the people. When you say as they currently are within the economy, what do you mean? As they currently are within the economy. No, it's, you're just leading to confusion. Just say the state. The state is the form of the people. The people in the economy clearly is different from the form of the people in the state. That's why there's a distinction of the, that's why the economy is distinct from the state in the first place. Thank you, Soul Solas. Listen, guys, I've, I actually should, should have done this more, way more early on. The one thing that separates based from Reddit is Plato. It's the one, if you don't take, if you don't understand Plato, you are literally, your brain will always be in Reddit. You will always have a Reddit brain. You will never, ever, ever fucking understand what infrared is. If you don't fucking understand Plato. I'm not saying you have to agree with everything Plato says, but you need to understand it. You have to get it. If you don't fucking master Plato, you will never, ever, ever fucking reach any fucking level of red pillar based. Ever. If a form is formalized in context, what is the context of the state? The state for Plato is the ideal republic. It is the good itself. That is what the good is. It's the state. This idea of the state being the form of the people. <laughs> Plato. Where Plato? Read it in Plato's Republic.
I'm not even getting into like the neo platonism and shit. No, it's not the economic good. This is where I'm fucking having a hard time just describing this. Because then someone said, whoa, what about quantities of money? Wouldn't that be goods? <sighs> Fuck. This is so fucking pathetic, guys. I'm just pissed about the... F Honestly, I'm just pissed about the fucking viewer account. It's like, I waste my time on this fucking shit. Go fucking watch some e-girls with fucking 600 views. Blowing me out of the fucking water. Nobody wants to learn shit. You know what I mean? Nobody fucking even cares about this shit. Bunch of fucking little bitches. I'm not even gonna bitch about it. But you know what I am gonna do? Going forward, I'm gonna ban every single fucking person who's like, How does this become so vulgar? Why is he always talking to e-girls? Why is he always uh, doing this, this, this shit on Zerka's show? Why is it? Because nobody fucking cares about this shit. That's fucking why. Nobody fucking cares. I promise you no one gives a fuck about this shit, man. Nobody gives a fuck about it. When I talk about foreign policy, literally shove foreign policy in your fucking ass. There is nothing more important before, before anything, before anything. Like, the minimum is understanding Plato and knowing how to fucking relate that to Marxism. Just the fucking foreign policy doesn't matter, dude. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Nothing matters except this. Money is an excess. It's an excess. That's the thing. Money is an excess. A remainder. It's the remainder of the state. A remainder of and over the state in its relation to the economy. Confrontation with its otherness. The economy. Human labor. And attempt, attempt to account for otherness every time the state attempts to be in the midst of its otherness in the form in human labor or the economy it is confronted with the excess of the latter over its finite singular form money is this excess hence money is quantifiable
Money is quantifiable. Money is not the good which I was tr so money is not the good because the good is singular. You cannot quantify the good is the issue. You can't quantify it. Does Plato account for the otherness other than a moment of the good, system of the good? Fuck this shit, man. It's like every time the viewer goes down, I'm like less motivated to even bother trying to explain this. You know what I mean? Instead of finishing this, I'm just going to leave you with a question, which is why I did this shit in the first place. What is the ideal republic of 19th century capitalism? The British Empire, right? Nineteenth century capitalism is almost wholly synonymous with English modernity. This is the geopolitical implication and significance of socialism. I'll just explain it like this, right? 19th century capitalism is English modernity. It's English modernity. The common social substance of... It's common social substance, or its ideal republic, is the British Empire, which remains occluded consigned to the background and taken for granted. This is why alternative industrializations that were independent of English capital uh, 
or at least possessed a limited relationship to the um, concentration of English capital used for loans, etc. Japan, Germany, and later the con Japan, Germany, etc. appear socialistic because they cannot take the ideal republic for granted and must establish its relationship to the economy in They have their own ideal republic. It is in communism which undertakes the process of modernization and are entirely independent of the concentrations of capital established by the British Empire that this ideal republic becomes explicit. Socialism means, repeat, the founding gesture of the founding sin and the primal and to resurrect the primal father of the ideal republic. And that is what is happening. This is my simplification for you. I want everyone here, since there's only 300 of you, I'm just going to assume you are the fucking elite. Everyone else, I'm going to tell you the truth, guys. Everybody else is a pussy. All my, the other like 200 viewers that I have regularly, they're all a bunch of bitches. They're bitch made, you know? They got gyno, and they're only here for e-girls. They're not smart. They're a bunch of little bitches, right? And they're not the loyal OGs, the other 200 people that are here. You know, they're not actually the elites. So if you're going to be my fucking 300 Spartans and my fucking elite, I'm going to tell you to do your fucking homework and commit yourself before anything. Commit yourself to Plato. Commit yourself to mastering Plato, understanding Plato. He is the most important Western thinker ever, probably. Commit yourself to studying and mastering Plato. You need to be able to spit out to me a full understanding of Plato. Okay? And I want you to begin... I don't want you to read some dumb fucking stupid bullshit about Plato. I want you to read what Alain Bedou has to say about Plato. Hélène Bédou, Bédou, read his readings on Plato. Read Reza Negaristani's writings on Plato. And lectures if you can. If you can find them. Or pay for them. Um, don't read these dumb fucking simplifications. Plato is going to change your fucking life. Plato will change your fucking life. And remember, I am not a fan of Plato. I hate all philosophy. But guess what? I don't hate it, but I'm against all philosophy. But guess what? The only thing, the only thing, the only thing 
that separates you from Reddit is Plato. The one thing that separates you from Reddit is Plato. Plato teaches you that there is one world, one humanity, one common being. Everything in your world you are accountable for as a man. Your whole fucking world you are accountable for as a man. Socrates was literally invented by Plato. All Aristotle was was a critic of Plato. That's the only fucking reason he ever existed. Because he was a critic of Plato. That's it. You need to understand you need to understand that like we're not just here as like uh you know you're not just some so some reddit soy guy is just some fucking guy no ugly fat fuck who sits here thinking, I'm just here living in this world. I didn't choose to be born. <laughs> Disney, Marvel, science. I was born and there's all these stars. <laughs> That's the fucking Redditor, you understand? A platonic man is born in this world and says... All of this, all of this that you see, I am accountable for as a man. The whole weight of the fucking world is on my shoulders. Why do you think we're patriots? Why do you think we're patriots? Why do you think we're patriots? We're accountable for this. The key to patriotic communism is Plato. If you want. It's Plato. He's the reason. It's not fucking Heidegger. It's Plato. You fucking Redditor dumb idiot bitch. We are living in socialism, whether we want to acknowledge it or not. And we're living in fucking socialism because the primary driving force of our economy is social in nature. And it's social in the form of signals and information. Just like what fucking happened with GameStop.
And by the way, the whole fucking thing about the psychopathological vice is because when people say, we live in capitalism, this is classical capitalism. They're trying to make money. Trying to make money for what? What do most people want to make money for? Is it just to make more money? No, it's not. Most, <coughs> most people want to make money for a reason, right? And that reason is social. Oh, you're just trying to make money. Dude, after the fucking 60s and 70s, the new left anti-capitalism was literally just based on what? The critique of capital. Capitalism, man. Capitalism, man. And the fucking economy already became fucking socialist. Capitalism, man. It's like capitalism, man. It's almost like a conspiracy theory. You know that? Anti-capitalism is in, in the West is almost like a conspiracy theory. It's almost like they think capitalism is like a conspiracy capitalism man it's the capitalism you gotta get you gotta not be into that capitalism man john underscore r donated five dollars it's finals week for us peasants trapped in the rat race i'm staying here to the end of each stream even if it means i fail all my classes long live the spartans Jan R, you don't thank you for the fuck, bro. You don't gotta do that though. Come on, you don't gotta fucking do well in your classes. You don't waste your fucking money watching my streams. Just watch the vod. You know you don't have to. You can just watch the vod, dude. You don't have to fucking. You know. But. Plato is the most evil man who ever was existed. Guess what? That's an accomplishment. Plato was an evil man. He was evil. He was definitely fucking evil. Right? He, was, he might even be Satan. The Satan of Abrahamic religions might even be Plato. Who fucking knows? Plato is evil. But guess what? You will never be based until you understand him. You will never be based until you understand him. Capitalism, man. Capitalism. You gotta understand the capitalism, man. Take the pill, man. I can't fucking believe it's that simple. It's literally Plato's the reason I'm not like anyone else. The reason I'm so different is because of Plato. That's why it's Plato. Oh, I realize it. That's why I don't fuck with Twitter or none of these people. Because of Plato. Now I realize it.
What about him was evil? He's a servant of the Demiurge. Break out of Plato's cave. Break out of Plato himself. And his uh, way of enslaving the mind. Because that's what he does. He enslaves your mind. Or he makes your mind enslaved to itself. And he forecloses any relationship between the mind and reality. Plato does not allow us to arrive at a relationship to reality as an object of reality. It's everything backwards. Everything backwards. Plato begins with the good and then after is the melodrama of the fact that the good falls into the earth. The sun falls into the earth. The good becomes a thing. How can the good be a thing? That's not the real good, man. Cope. That's the issue with Plato. He always accounts for everything after the fact. Shut up, you potato-shaped baloney. You're a little bitch. You're a fucking pussy. You're a fucking pussy. You're a little fucking bitch. And your mother would gladly suck my fucking cock. With glee. And she would beg for it too. I would fuck your mother and tear her fucking pussy apart. And I would be your fucking father. I am your fucking father. I am your father. I am your father. And you are a fucking miserable fucking disappointment. Get the fuck out of my chat. You just got disowned, you bitch. Bap is a fucking idiot. He just jacks off to fucking fantasies. He's a pervert. He's a fucking pervert. And I'll tell you why he's a fucking pervert. Because he imagines what the left would find the most scary. And he just adopts that. But his imagination is a little too fucking limited. Why do I have 600 viewers? I have 600 viewers? Why? The fuck? Oh, it says 470. Okay, I thought you I thought it jumped to 600. Okay. Okay, whatever. Fuck the viewers. We're about to wrap this shit up anyway. He's a pervert. He he bases his entire fucking thing on someone else's fantasy. It's the definition of a pervert. He's adopting a leftist fantasy of the right. There's no authentic substance. He just thinks of something. He's like, yo, wouldn't that be edgy? And that's it. It has nothing to do with Plato.
I read his shit where he was like, the role of the philosopher was regenerating the elite because the elite became corrupted. He has this fantasy of a pervert incest fantasy because no elite has ever, no decadent elite has ever been overthrown by the youth of that elite. Never. It's never happened. In fact, the youth are what come to epitomize that corruption. The reason Socrates was corrupting the youth was because this was the youth just like in the Chinese Cultural Revolution, that was more representative of those outside the aristocracy. He doesn't understand that it was a class war against the aristocracy and their fucking stupid kids. You think the youth of the aristocracy are these noble warriors? They're a bunch of pussies. That's just how it's always been like that in history. Sorry for getting mad. Because you shouldn't get emotional or whatever. It's just intellectual shit. But it's stupid. The youth of the aristocracy have always reflected the decadence of their parents. It's always nomads from outside the community. Whether from the countryside or whether literal nomads from outside the community that have to come in and rejuvenate a civilization. It's never the fucking snot-nosed fucking offspring of the fucking aristocrats themselves. That they're not enough. It's always from the bottom up. That's what happened in the Cultural Revolution too, by the way. In the Cultural Revolution, kids from the countryside came to the cities. You know, uh, the aristocrats in the cities, aka the urban youth, they didn't lead the way. They were actually... Worse. Are you saying a country boy can survive? Yes. I am indeed saying that. I am indeed saying that. Who should I raid? Who should I raid? Stardust. Fuck no. You know what? This is the truth. I'm not raiding anyone. I'm not raiding anyone. I'm just ending it. I'm just going to end this stream. Nobody's getting my raid. I will see you tomorrow on the showdown. And one last thing.